put the puzzle together, piece by piece, and discover the whole truth. You're going to enjoy the story of Moses more and more. We're back in the fascinating land of Egypt. We're ready to explore the history of Moses and the Pharaoh with whom he had contact. You're looking at an ancient canal from the time of Joseph called Bar Yusuf. According to local tradition, this was the work of Joseph during Hyksos occupation. Walking amongst the ruins of ancient Afaris, where Joseph lived and ruled, my thoughts went out to a verse in the book of Exodus. It says, Now Joseph and all these brothers and all that generation died, but the Israelites were fruitful and multiplied greatly and became exceeding numerous, so that the land was filled with them. Then a new king, Tutmosis I, who did not know about Joseph, came to power in Egypt. I stood at his tomb, the very first one built in the Valley of the Kings, and I'm reading the following verse, 9 and 10. Look, he said to his people, The Israelites have become too much, too numerous for us. Come, we must deal shrewdly with them, or they will become even more numerous, and if war breaks out, will join our enemies, fight against us, and leave the country. Is there any record of a pharaoh who introduced slave labor? Yes. The hieroglyphics tell us that that Moses I was the first pharaoh to introduce Semitic slave labor. Archaeologists discovered his bust, and you're looking at it. I'm reading from Exodus 1.22. Then Pharaoh, that Moses I, gave this order to all his people. Every boy that is born, you must throw into the river, but let every girl live. In desperation, the parents of Moses hid him in a papyrus basket amongst the reeds. And this is where Hatshepsut, daughter of Pharaoh Tutmosis I, found the baby. The Bible says that she went for a bath in the Nile. But she did more than that. She came to worship the Nile, one of the many Egyptian deities called Hapi or Uru. When you read the account of Exodus chapter 2, you notice that Moses was first reared by his own mother. She laid a monotheistic foundation that could not be shaken by all the attractiveness of polytheistic religion in Egypt. When this little lad was about 12 years of age, his mother kissed him for the last time and took him to the Egyptian palace. Exodus 2 verse 10 says, When the child grew older, she took him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became a son. She named him Moses, saying, I drew him out of the water. His Egyptian name was Hapi Moses. Hapi stands for the Nile God, and Moses means taken out of. When Moses wrote the book of Exodus, he deleted the first part of his name because of the heathen connotation. While looking at the obelisks of Tatmoses I on the right and his daughter Hatshepsut on the left at Karnak, I asked myself a few questions. How did she persuade her father, Tatmoses I, to retract, rescind his death decree on all Hebrew baby boys? I could only come to one conclusion. You see, I've only got one child. And if Loretta Key asks me a favor, I'll gladly do it. When I visited the ruins of the ancient university where Moses was educated, I thought of the following verse of Scripture. Acts 7.22 Moses was educated in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was powerful in speech and action. Moses the man who delivered these people from slavery. In a unique way, he typifies Christ who gladly, willingly delivers us from the slavery of our selfish natures. We are working towards a climax, the greatest recorded in ancient history, the deliverance of two million slaves. Moses becomes a type of Christ, the great deliverer who wants to deliver you from chronic heartache, guilt feelings, or whatever negative emotion you may experience. See you next time. God bless. Put the puzzle together, piece by piece, 
and discover the whole truth. Today we're going to talk about one of the most controversial issues in the history of mankind. It's titled The Man Behind the Mask and we're going to look at the theology of the Antichrist. Now what is behind this mask? To find out we have to go to Daniel chapter 7 because there in great detail Daniel reveals to us who this power is and what his intentions are. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and vision of his head upon his bed. Then he wrote the dream and told the sum of the matter. Now this dream is a parallel to Daniel chapter 2, except it's like a, a coloring in book. Daniel chapter 2, you have the outlines. In Daniel chapter 7, you have the coloring. And so we get far more detail as to what is going to happen in the course of history. I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven strove upon the great sea. And if we remember our little dictionary of terms, prophetic terms, then the sea is the waters, the multitudes, the people, the nations. We have that definition in the book of Revelation. The winds are strife, war. So war amongst the nations, and four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse one from another. Now, a beast in the biblical term, by definition, in Daniel as well, is a kingdom or a political power, a political entity. So there are the texts, seas, Revelation 17, 15, wind, war, Jeremiah 49, 36 and 37, and beasts are kingdoms, Daniel 7, 17. The four great beasts are four kingdoms that will arise upon the earth. So we cannot make a beast something else than what the Bible defines it to be. A beast is a kingdom, it's a political entity. And we have to use that definition throughout in these prophetic terms. The first was like a lion, and it had eagle wings, I beheld, till the wings thereof were plucked, and it was lifted up from the earth. So here we have a lion beast, and it has eagle wings. And it was made to stand upon his feet as a man, and a man's heart was given to it. Now this is a very interesting part of the prophecy. This man aspect is man lifting himself up and standing on his own two feet, divorced from his unity with God, and he takes the position of God upon the earth. Well, the parallel, Babylon, in both Daniel 2 and Daniel 7, in the one it is the head of gold, in the other one it is the lion beast. And there are many parallel texts to show this. A lion has come out of his lair, a destroyer of nations has set out, he has left his place to lay waste your land, your towns will be in ruins without inhabitants, Jeremiah 4, 7. Here Jeremiah predicts the Babylonian power that would come to destroy Jerusalem and he uses the symbol of the lion. The lion has always been a symbol of Babylon, and here we have old depictions of lions with eagle wings as symbols of the Babylonian power. Here in the Middle East, you will still find in the ancient ruins this depiction. So in the time of Daniel, everybody would have known that the lion with eagle wings was a symbol of Babylon. And suddenly another beast, a second like a bear, it was raised up on one side and had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. And they said thus to it, Arise, devour much flesh, Daniel 7.5. So a second power arises, raised up on one side. It consists of two components, one somewhat more powerful initially than the other. And it has to devour flesh, beast flesh, so it's the next power. In Daniel 2, it was the Medo-Persian power, two entities. Here we have a bear raised up on one side, two entities, three ribs in the mouth. Fascinating depiction. After this, I beheld and lo, another like a leopard, which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl. The beast also had four heads, and dominion was given to it, Daniel 7, 6. After the Medo-Persian power, we have the Greek power, the Greek empire, and it has four heads. So this power must be divided into four components. And it is the equivalent of the hips of bronze. So Daniel is paralleling 
the history of Daniel 2, coloring it in with a little bit more detail. Now that being broken, whereas four heads stood up for it, four kingdoms shall stand up out of the nation, but not in his power. Originally, Alexander the Great had the power all together in one beast component. Then it was divided into four. And history tells us that this is exactly what happened to the Greek Empire. Of Alexander's generals at his death, Benjamin Wheeler says, this historian, each one wetted the sword against the other and the empire went down in a tangle of strife and carnage. With the close of the century, it resolved itself into four well-ascertained domains. So history proves the biblical prophecies to be spot on. It was Cassander, Lysimachus, Ptolemy, and the Seleucus kingdom that eventually survived. After this, I saw in night vision and behold a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong, Daniel 7.7. 7. It had huge iron teeth. There's the iron component as we had it in Daniel chapter 2. It was devouring, breaking in pieces, and trampling the residue with its feet. Well, if we draw the parallel, we have the Roman Empire, this mighty empire that crushed all the nations and devoured them, incorporating them in the mighty Roman Empire. Now here's something very strange about this beast. Daniel 7, 7, it was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. Now the definition of a horn in the biblical context is a kingdom, so out of this would come ten kingdoms, and it was different from all the others. Now what was this different aspect that we are dealing with? In Daniel chapter 2, there were the legs of iron, depicting Rome, the Eastern and the Western Empire, and now here we have the ten-horned beast, and we're going to have somewhat more detail to contend with. Then I would know the truth of the fourth beast, which was different, diverse, from all the others, exceeding dreadful, whose teeth were of iron and his nails of brass, which devoured, break in pieces, and stamped the residue with his feet. It's interesting, in the German translations, Luther actually translated that brass as clay, which is an interesting comparison with what we have in Daniel chapter 2. Now, what about this fourth beast? What was different about it? The fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon the earth, which shall be different, diverse, from all kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth, and shall tread it down and break it in pieces. So this power would eventually have universal dominion, and there was something different about it. The German historian Ferdinand Schlegel says, it was as if the iron-footed god of war actually bestrode the globe and every step struck out new torrents of blood. Philosophy of History, page 261, referring to this Roman entity. So the parallel, Daniel chapter 2, Daniel chapter 7, the same kingdoms, 476, right up until the end of time, this power would exist and it would be different. I was considering the horns. There were these ten horns that had arisen. Remember the statue had ten toes. Here are ten horns. And there was another horn, a little one. If we translate it carefully, you could read it. It grew from littleness. Coming up amongst them. So Rome was divided into ten, and once that had occurred, another arose amongst them. And this power is the one that is behind the mask, hidden in the sands of history, before whom three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots. So here we have an identifying feature. It arises amongst the ten, and it destroys three horn powers three political entities. And there in this horn, there were the eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking pompous words. So here you have the same as you had in Babylon. Here is the man component taking the place of God, taking the place of authority and blasphemous power.
What does this mean? Pompous. This little horn power shall be different from the first, Daniel 7.24. So here is the component of this beast that is different. And we have to find out why it is different. All the others were political entities as such, but this one is political because it is a horn, but there is something different about it. Now let's have a look at the attributes of this little horn power. And this little horn power has always been depicted as the Antichrist power by all the reformers in the history of this study. It arises out of the fourth beast, so it is Roman. It doesn't arise anywhere else. It is Roman, Daniel 7, 7 and 8. It arises amongst the ten horns, so it must come out of the Western Roman Empire because that is the part that was divided into ten. I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn. Let's have a look at another identifying feature. It arises after the ten horns were already in place because it comes up amongst them. And another shall arise after them, verse 24. So we're looking at a time period after 476 AD. It comes out of Rome. It comes up amongst the western powers of Rome. And it is different from the other horns. He shall be diverse from the first, verse 24. So not only is it secular, political, there's something else that's interesting about it. It's more stout than its fellows, so it grows up to have political clout so that it can even tell the others what to do. More stout than his fellows, verse 20. It uproots three kingdoms. So in history, we must find a power that as a consequence of its growth has to get rid of three powers that are opposing Eyes like the eyes of a man, and spoke great words against the Most High. The text we find in verse 8 and 25. In this horn were the eyes like the eyes of a man. So here is this man power, man lifting himself up, and a mouth speaking great things against the Most High. So this is an anti-God power. It will wear out the saints. Verse 25. So here is a persecuting power that attacks God's people. Another interesting attribute about this power we find in verse 25, it changes times and laws. Now which laws would God be interested about? Surely God is interested in his universal law, his moral law. So this power has to affront God by changing not only the laws, but times as well. This is fascinating. We have to ask ourselves, who is this power and what are its intentions? Time, times, and a half a time. So here we have a time prophecy. They shall be given into his hand until a time, time, and the dividing of times. Newer translations will translate it directly and say three and a half years, prophetically speaking. Now, we'll have to look into that time prophecy to find out how it applies and to whom it applies. An eleventh attribute that we find in the book of Daniel is it shall de devour the whole earth. The fourth beast, which shall be different, so this different component, the little horn component, shall devour the whole earth and shall trample it and crush it. So this must be a universal dominion. It exists until the end until the Ancient of Days came, verse 22. So it has a particular start amongst the ten nations of Europe, initially, when Rome was divided, and it exists until the end. So it must be here now. And it is a blasphemous power, so it assumes religious activities and powers. So we have a religio-political power that is universal, and prescribes to the whole world. Its dominion shall be taken away at the end of time, but the judgment shall sit and they shall take away his dominion to consume and to destroy it unto the end. 
So there will come a time of retribution when this power will be eliminated. Now Paul referred to this power in his writings and he referred to him as the man of sin. In 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 to 10, we read about the rise of this power. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that you be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. They believed Christ was about to come, and Paul said, no, no, no. There are some things which must happen historically before then. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except their coming a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. Now that term is used only twice in the Bible. Once for Judas, and once for the man of sin. Now Judas publicly embraced Christ, but he betrayed him with a kiss. Is it possible that the second power publicly embraces Christ but betrays him with a kiss? We will have to see. He opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped. So here we have this blasphemous, I the man will take the place of attitude so that he as God sits in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. So here is a power that subscribes or ascribes to itself the powers that belong rightly to God alone. And this is the spirit of Antichrist whereof we have heard that it should come and even now already is in the world, 1 John 4, 3. So this power is a power that stretches over time. It's not applied to one individual, it's applied to a horn, to a political entity, which has a political religious leader and this power exists until the end of time. So it is a universal continuum from the time of the fall of Rome to the end of time. Now all the reformers were very clear as to who they believed this power was. Paul continues, Remember ye not that when I was yet with you I told you these things? And now you know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time, for the mystery of iniquity doth already ready work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. If we use the BBE translation, it says there, there is one who is keeping back the evil till he is taken out of the way. So there was some power preventing the rise of this Antichrist power. And when that power is taken away, it shall arise. Now today there are so many theologies on this issue and people are looking forward to the coming of the Antichrist when the Bible says he's been here for centuries. And uh, who was this power that had to be removed? And then shall the wicked be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. So here is a power religious system that uses signs and wonders and miracles and people are deceived by these issues. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. This is a terrible indictment in the word of God. Now, who is this power? Let's go to the early church fathers to find out who they taught was this power that restrained the rise of the Antichrist power. Grattan Guinness, in his book Romanism and the Reformation, writes, Here we have a point on which Paul affirms the existence of knowledge in the Christian church. The early church knew, he says, what the hindrance was that kept the power from rising. The early church tells us what it did know upon the subject and no one in these days can be in a position to contradict its testimony as to what Paul had by word of mouth only told the Thessalonians. It is a point on which ancient tradition alone can have authority. Modern speculation is positively impertinent on such a subject. And he has a point. What did the church fathers teach? 
What was this power that restrained the rise of the Antichrist power? Now Tertullian, in his work on the resurrection, and this man lived 200 AD, this is when it was formulated, he says, He who now hinders must hinder until he be taken out of the way. What obstacle is there but the Roman state? the falling away of which by being scattered into ten kingdoms shall introduce Antichrist. So when Rome falls, he says, and when it is divided into ten kingdoms, then the Antichrist shall arrive. Well, that's biblical, and that makes a lot of sense. Here we have John Chrysostom in his homily on 2 Thessalonians. He was Bishop of Constantinople, 390 AD. He writes, only there is one that restraineth now until he be taken out of the way. That is, when the Roman Empire is taken out of the way, then he, the Antichrist, shall come. We have the consenting testimony of the early fathers from Irenaeus, the disciple of St. John, down to Christostom, Jerome, to the effect that it was understood to be the imperial power ruling and residing at Rome. So here we have this concept that when Rome falls, the Antichrist power will arrive. Now, why is it that the world today believes that the Antichrist power was a power sometime in the past, in the, in the Greek time period, called preterism, this belief? Or that he's coming in the future, called futurism, this belief? Why do we have these theologies when the Bible is so clear as to when the Antichrist would arrive? While the Caesars held imperial power, it was impossible for the predicted Antichrist to arise. On the fall of the Caesars, he would arise. Gratian Guinness in his book, Romanism and the Reformation. Paul did not, not identify the restraining power, which they knew to be Rome, for fear of reprisals. Remember, the Christian church was under persecution by Rome. So Paul doesn't write in his letter, it is Rome that has to disappear. He told them that by word of mouth. And because of persecution, he kept back those details. Now here we have the works of Alcaza. Alcaza and Ribera were two theologians of the Roman Catholic Church that tried to sway the evidence away from the biblical Antichrist to an Antichrist coming in the past or coming into the future. The amazing thing is that today, this past and future theology is married into one theology. Now there is an ultimate confusion. It came both in the past, which they say is a type of the one that's coming in the future. But the Bible says he is a continuum from the fall of Rome to the end of time. So these theologies are Roman Catholic theologies that have been placed into the world to take the heat of the power that was identified by the reformers. He arises out of the fourth beast, he's Roman. That does away with futurism where he arises somewhere in the Middle East. It also takes away the power of, Greek, of a Greek king, Antiochus Epiphanes IV, who was supposedly the typical Antichrist, because he doesn't come out of the fourth beast, he comes out of the third beast. He arises amongst the ten horns, so it tells us a time period after the fall of Rome. He's different from the others. He's not only secular, he's also ecclesiastical. When the last wave of the barbarian invasion had spent its force, the face of Europe had been transformed. Independent Germanic kingdoms had been established on the ruins of the Roman Empire. Church history tells us that. And under the ruins of this Roman Empire, there gradually rose a new order of states whose central point was the papal see. Therefore, inevitably resulted a position not only new, but very different from the former. The Church and Churches, page 42 to 43. Here we have the only logical conclusion as to what Daniel is trying to say. Historian C.C. C. Eckhart confirms, he says, when the Roman Empire had disintegrated and its place had been taken by a number of rude barbarous kingdoms, the Roman Catholic Church not only became independent of the state in religious affair, but dominated secular affairs as well. So here you have a religio-political entity. 
more stout than his fellows? Was the papacy more stout than its fellows? Most definitely. Kings had to appear before the tribunal. They were excommunicated if they weren't in line with the teaching. They say, we define that the Holy Apostolic See and the Roman Pontiff holds the primacy over the whole world. In our next portion, we will consider this in somewhat more detail. Put the puzzle together, piece by piece, and discover the whole truth. Put the puzzle together, piece by piece, and discover the whole truth. So it is only the Roman pontiffs who had the power to let the secular kings stand in the snow awaiting an audience and to be reinstated. Their power was absolute. In fact, in the most holy councils, they define their power as such. We define that the Holy Apostolic See and the Roman Pontiff holds the primacy over the whole world. This is a universal primacy that they lay claim to. The vicar of the Incanite, Son of God, anointed high priest and supreme temporal ruler, the Pope, sat in his tribunal impartially to judge between nation and nation, between people and prince, between sovereign and subjects. Henry Cardinal Manning, temporal power of the vicar of Jesus. So this is a historic fact. This power fulfills all the criteria of Daniel chapter 7. Did he uproot three kingdoms? Then I would know the truth about the fourth beast, which was diverse from all the others and of the ten horns that were in his head, and of the other which came up, and before whom three fell, Daniel 7, 19, 20. Well, history tells us that that is a historic fact. The ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise, and another shall arise after them, and he shall be different, and he is the one that will uproot three kingdoms kingdoms. Now there are the ancient divisions as they occurred in history, the Suevi, the Physigoths, the Franks, the Anglo-Saxons, the Burgundians, the Alemanni, the Aus Ostrogoths, the Lombards, and the Heruli. And then there were the Vandals, of course, on the other side. Now what about these disappearances of these three horns? Well, the Heruli, they were eliminated in 493 at the instigation of the papacy using the power of the Eastern Roman Emperor to rid the world of this power. The Vandals disappeared in 534 as a consequence of the same interference, and the Ostrogoths who also ruled in Rome and prevented the power from rising to fullness, disappeared in 538 AD. It is claimed that they were Arian and therefore antagonistic to Catholic theology, and that is why they had to go. But those are only Catholic sources that confirm that, and there might be other reasons, more biblical reasons, as to why they had to go. So of all the nations that we have today, we only have the remnants of those original ones. The Alemanni are the Germans, the Burgundians, the Swiss, the Franks, the French, the Lombards, the Italians, the Saxons, the English the Suevi, the Portuguese, and the Visigoths, the Spanish. But the Ruli, the Vandals, and the Ostrogoths are extinct, removed because of the influence of the little horn power. It had eyes like a man and spoke great words against the Most High, and it made war against the saints, so it was going to wear out the saints. Does Rome qualify? The Bible says, And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemy. So what is blasphemy in the Bible? It was given him unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. He shall speak great words against the Most High, shall wear out the saints of the Most High, think to change times and laws, and they will be given into his hand until the time, time, and the dividing of times. This must be one of the most loaded verses in the Bible. Let's have a look at the biblical definition of blasphemy. We find it in John chapter 10. Verse 30 and 33, I and the Father are one. The Jews answered him, saying, We do not stone you for a good work, but for blasphemy. And now comes the definition, and because you, being a man, make yourself God. So if you make yourself God when you are a mere man, that is blasphemy. And seeing their faith, he said to him, Man, your sins are forgiven. 
And the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins except God alone? Luke 5, 20 to 21. So here we have the two biblical definitions. Making yourself God is blasphemy. Saying that you can take the prerogative of God and forgive sins, that's a blasphemy too. But the Roman Catholic Church applies both to itself. Catholic Encyclopedia, Volume 12, the judicial authority will include the power to pardon sins. Seek where you will through heaven and earth, you will find one created being who can forgive the sinner, who can free him from the chains of hell. That extraordinary being is the priest, the Roman Catholic priest. The Catholic priest, page 78. Roman Catholic sources confirm that they apply this power to themselves. Thou art a priest forever, says the ordaining bishop. He is no longer a man, a sinful child of Adam, but an altar Christos. Here we have another Christ taking the place of Jesus Christ. Forever a priest of the Most High with power over the Almighty. Now there's a prerogative which places the ball of these prophetic terms straight into the court of the Roman Sea. The Pope is not only the representative of Jesus Christ, but he is Jesus Christ himself, hidden under the veil of flesh. Anti-Christos, in the place of Jesus Christ. In most cases, the Greek means in the place of. It can also be against. In this case, both apply. God himself is obliged to abide by the judgment of his priests, and either not to pardon or to pardon according as they refuse or give absolution. The sentence of the priest precedes, and God subscribes to it. Dignities and Duties of the Priests, volume 12, page 27. So here we have all the biblical criteria which apply to this power and this power alone. Rome claims that it has power over the Almighty. The priest decides whether you will be saved or whether you will be lost. The Pope is of so great dignity and so exalted that he is not a mere man, but as it were, God. And the vicar of God is likewise the divine monarch, the supreme emperor, king of kings, so that if it were possible that angels might err in the faith or might think contrary to the faith, they could be judged and excommunicated by the Pope. Here are the blasphemous statements of the papacy. Now these cannot be rescinded because over the years they have been inculcated in Catholic theology and they have to take the conditions and the views of the fathers into account in terms of their tradition which they base their theology on. In 1439 the Council of Florence decreed we define that the Roman Pontiff is successor of the Blessed Peter, Prince of the Apostles and true Vicar of Christ taking this position of one only individual who controls the theology of the entire world. Cardinal Bellamine writes, All the names which in Scripture are applied to Christ, by virtue of which it is established that he is over the church, all the same names are applied to the Pope on the authority of the councils. So here we have a power that does exactly what Daniel said this power would do. Here are some of the titles, the blasphemous titles, given in Rome from our palace the 10th of February 1817 the 14th jurisdiction of the Most Holy Pontiff and Father in Christ, and our Lord, our God, the Pope Leo XII. So here he makes himself God, and he claims that he holds upon this earth the place of God Almighty. He qualifies as a blasphemous power. We define that the Holy Apostolic See and the Roman Pontiff holds the primacy over the whole world, so he has this universal application. Only in the little horn do we find its fulfillment. In fact, Thomas Aquinas wrote, Secular power is subject to the spiritual power as the body is subject to the soul. And therefore it is not usurpation of authority if the spiritual prelate interfere in temporal things concerning those matters in which the secular power is subject to him. So here we have a secular ruler who controls the conscience of mankind. The Council of Trent declared all temporal power is his dominion, jurisdiction, government of the whole earth. It is his by divine right. All rulers of the earth are his subjects and must submit to him. Did the Roman Catholic system persecute the saints? Did it wear out the saints? Well, there was a picture of the Colosseum which speaks by itself. 
The Catholic Church is a respecter of conscience and of liberty. Nevertheless, when confronted by heresy, she has recourse to force, to corporal punishment, to torture. She lit in Italy the funeral piles of the Inquisition. Catholic professor Alfred Boudrilla, the Catholic Church, Renaissance and Protestantism. In fact, the Inquisition was instituted to find those guilty who differed with the Church. Here's an interesting definition on heresy. Heresy, Greek, heresis, choice, deciding for oneself what one shall believe and practice by using the Bible as your expositor. Ancient instruments of torture that were used by the Inquisition. Here we have the Huguenot Monument. Here is the woman standing on the globe, broken chain in her hand, the chain of bondage, and in the right hand, the Bible. She was going to base her faith on the Bible and the Bible alone. Did it change times and laws? Well, Rome thinks that it can change laws. Daniel 7.25, he would think to change times and laws. Of course, God's law is immutable. You cannot change it, but they think they can. The Pope has power to change times, to abrogate laws, and to dispense with all things, even the precepts of Christ. This is a very blasphemous statement that comes from the pen of the papal system. The Pope can modify divine law, prompta biblioteca. What an affront that you can be more powerful than God. The Catholic Encyclopedia says, the church of the changing the day of rest from the Jewish Sabbath, so here we have an issue of time and law, or the seventh day of the week to the first, made the third commandment refer to Sunday as the day to be kept holy as the Lord's day. So they admit even in their encyclopedia that they messed with the times of God and the laws of God. The Converse Catechism of Catholic Doctrine, which is the Sabbath day? They know Saturday is the Sabbath day. Why do we observe Sunday instead of Saturday? We observe Sunday instead of Saturday because the Catholic Church at the Council of Laodicea, A.D. 336, transferred the solemnity from Saturday to Sunday. So they claimed they modified the law. Did it rule for a time, times and half a time, and eventually the entire world? The saints will be handed to him for a time, time, and half a time. We'll just briefly go into this prophecy. We'll deal with it later in more detail. A time, prophetically, one prophetic year was 360 days. We will use the biblical injunction of taking a day for a year, as the prophet Ezekiel tells us. We also find it in the book of Numbers. So if we add them up, we come to... 1,260 days or three and a half prophetic years of 360 days. And if we take a day for a year, did this power rule secularly as a horn for 1,260 literal years? And the answer is yes. With the conquest of Rome by Belisarius commences the history of the Middle Ages. Vigilus ascended the papal chair 538 AD. That's when the Ostrogoths were removed under the military protection of Belisarius. So 538 AD, it becomes the secular power that controls all other powers. And if we add 1,260 to that, we get to 1798. Now, what happened in 1798? So the Ten Kingdoms were established in 476 AD. Here we have the Ten Horns. Then it arises amongst them. It, re it gains its political clout in 538 AD, established as a full horn power, political power. And then Bertier enters Rome in 1798 and proclaims a republic. Half of Europe thought Napoleon's veto would be obeyed and that with the Pope, the papacy was dead. So the secular power of the Pope is removed in 1798 and between the two time periods of its rise and its first secular fall, exactly 1,260 years. Fascinating. Many of the great Christians of the Reformation and post-Reformation period they believed that the papacy was the Antichrist. They stood firm by this issue. 
using the criteria in the book of Daniel. Among the adherents of this interpretation were the Valdenses, who were cruelly persecuted, the Hussites, Wycliffe, Luther, Calvin, Swingley, Melanchthon, the Baptist theologian John Gill, the Martyrs, Cranmer, Tyndall, Latimer, Ridley. Tyndall gave us the English Bible. Fascinating history. In fact, the Reformers were so concerned about this issue that they put it in stone, lest posterity forget. If we go to the Ratshaus in Nuremberg in Germany, the Reformers placed the pictures and the symbols of Daniel in proud relief above the two entrances to that building. So over the one door, you have these amazing sculptures. You have on the one side the lion with eagle wings and next to it a prominent ruler. On the other side you have a beast with three ribs in its mouth and another prominent ruler. Let's look at a little bit of detail over here. We see the lion with eagle wings and the reformers wanted us to know who they said it was. So next to it they placed none other than Nebuchadnezzar. In other words, they were saying it is Babylon. If we go to the other depiction, the bear with the three ribs in its mouth over there, who did they place next to it? Cyrus the Great. So they were telling us they believed it was the Medo-Persian Empire. So I really haven't been saying anything new at all. Over the other door, we have the other two beasts. Let's go a little bit closer and see who they say that it was. Well, here you have the four-headed leopard beast, and uh, we defined it as Greeks. So who did they put next to it? Alexander the Great. So the reformers said, we are dealing with the Greek Empire, this part of the prophecy. And on the other side, the terrible beast with the ten horns, and a prominent horn amongst them. There it is. And who did they place next to it? None other than Julius Caesar. So they said it was Rome. Rome is the terrible beast. So, so far we are on track. Now remember that the modern world teaches that the Antichrist came in the past, preterism, and there are a number of churches which expound this view, and that it was a Greek king, Antiochus Epiphanes IV, but that doesn't match the prophecy at all. Because the prophecy tells us it came out of the fourth beast. Another group, Futurism, which is the greatest part of Christianity today, preaches that he will come sometime in the future. That's not biblical either. He arises after the fall of the Roman Empire and will remain until the end of time. So surely... That cannot be a right theology either. Isn't it interesting that both those theologies come from Roman Catholic sources and that they are part of the Counter-Reformation and that this Counter-Reformation has been drunk in by the modern Christian world? We have to have our feet firmly based on the Bible if we want to know whom we are dealing with. Now, who is this power that we are talking about over here? Who is this little horn that has the eyes of a man. And what did the reformers say? Who was it? Well, Luther didn't make any bones about it. He said, I know that the Pope is Antichrist and that his seat is that of Satan himself. The papacy is a general chase by command of the Roman pontiff for the purpose of running down and destroying souls. Now, it's interesting that Luther never really came out boldly with the statement in the beginning. He tried to reconcile issues in the church until he studied Daniel chapter 7. Then he boldly came out with a theology of separation from Rome because how could you be aligned to a system that takes Jesus Christ out of his primacy position, places a human being in its place, and says that salvation comes through that system rather than through Christ? 
Calvin says we call the Roman Pontiff Antichrist. So he made no bones about it. John Wesley, who started the great Methodist movement, said, He is in an emphatic sense the man of sin, and he increases all manner of sin above measure. All the reformers were absolutely direct when it came to this issue. John Knox said the Pope should be recognized as the very Antichrist. It's fascinating, this man, when he preached his very, very first sermon, where did he preach it from? He preached on Daniel chapter 7. And he depicted Rome as the Antichrist system. This is the one who said, give me Scotland or I die. So you see, the reformers knew who the Antichrist was. In fact, many of them died for their faith. Some of them were burnt at the stake. Some of them were strangled and then burnt at the stake. Some of them, like Wycliffe, died naturally and was afterwards dug up and burnt and ground to powder and his ashes strewn into the river. And they stood for what they believed. The great reformers all recognized where the enemy was. But today, this has been glossed over and we believe something different. Let not anyone deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come unless there first come a falling away. And the man of sin. What a perfect definition. In 1 John we read that sin is the transgression of the law. Here we don't only have the transgression of the law, we have the change of the law, which is even more the affront to say that I can change God's law. So the man of sin is the one who messes with God's law. And he shall be revealed, the son of perdition, the one who takes the position of Judas, openly embracing Jesus Christ, but secretly sidelining him, taking away his mediatorial role, replacing it with a mediatorial role of Mary, replacing it with a mediatorial role of the priest and the prelates and the popes and the friars. The system saves you, not Jesus. Your sins are forgiven by the priest, and that sentence precedes, and God has to subscribe to it according to their theology. They set up the kingdom. They rule from down here. But the kingdom of God is not of this world. So this is another system. This is the Antichrist system. It is in the place of Jesus Christ who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, setting himself forth that he is God. If you can claim to make the laws, to forgive sins, and to take the place of God Almighty, then you qualify on all of these counts, and that's exactly what the papacy does. So Paul defines it very succinctly. He shall devour the whole world, only the papacy lays claim to universal dominion in its public documentation. And it will continue to the end. So the Antichrist power is here, now, as it was in the days of Reformer. Futurism and preterism are figments of the imagination. They're not based on a thus says the Lord. Dominion shall be taken away at the end of time. That is a promise. But the judgment shall sit and they shall take away his rulership to cut off and to destroy until the end. And the kingdom and the rulership and the greatness of the kingdom under all the heavens shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all kingdoms shall serve and obey him, capital letter, Daniel 7.26. Not a secular power. Jesus Christ is the center of the prophecy Jesus Christ is the victor. Sideline him you can as creator, as redeemer, as lawgiver. You can sideline him, but he will be the victor in the end. May we be ready when he comes.